Well, isn't this neat? Greetings, folks, and you know what? Sometimes you've just got to reset and go back to the 1980s with your computing experience. Or at least I do. And the experience I'm interested in today is this lovely sender block of a system, the Sharp PC 7000, selling for $1,795 upon its introduction to the US by Sharp Electronics in October of 1985. A portable machine from the days when storage was measured in kilobytes, color graphics weren't a priority, and batteries weren't even a consideration here. Sure, slimmer, lighter, battery-powered portables existed, but if you wanted a proper IBM PC compatible to take with you on a trip in 85, chances are you'd choose a luggable like this. Which, believe it or not, was on the less ridiculous side of things, in terms of size and weight. Chunky next to more modern machines, no question, but relative to some of its contemporaries, the thing was downright slim. Compare it to something like the IBM Portable PC 5155 released a year prior, which was closer in size to a sewing machine than the lunchbox look of the PC 7000. Not only that, but the IBM was too large for the new 1985 FAA carry-on luggage size restrictions. The Sharp, however, conformed nicely, measuring roughly 16 by 8.5 by 6 inches, well within airline stipulations. And though it weighed two-thirds less than certain competitors, it still had some heft, weighing 21.5 pounds or 9.3 kilograms, including the keyboard. But yeah, it's a short and wide little thing, and I enjoy its company, so let's take a closer look. Which we can do thanks to LGR viewer Woody, who kindly sent it this way for the cost of shipping. He was under the impression it was unused, but eh, I have my doubts. There are scratches, stains, and signs of wear in the spots you'd most expect, plus this decidedly not stock strip of tactical Velcro, all pointing towards a previous life of service. But whoever first used it certainly kept it in great shape over the decades, with things like the serial port still having its protective cap installed, and the carrying handle still wrapped up in what I assume is its original plastic wrapping. Really, beyond a few nicks and scuffs, it should clean up well. So let me go ahead and do that before moving on, because after nearly 38 years, I think this PC-7000 deserves a bath. Oh heck yeah, and with that, we have a significantly cleaner system. I didn't think it was too dirty, but after seeing all the grime that wiped off and scraped out of those crevices, I'm feeling much better. There's just one thing that remains, and you know what, I know this may have been there for over three decades, but it's mine now, dang it, and I want to caress that handle. Ah, much better. A little wipe down of the residue, and wow, does this feel fresh. As does the entire PC, just in general, even before the cleaning. Yeah, I'll admit the biggest reason I took this thing in was due to its shape, its form factor, its overall style, and pizzazz. I'd say it's quite sharp looking, but that's too on the nose, so uh, I'm gonna go with spiffy. This is a spiffy system, and even if it didn't work, I'd still be happy to have it sitting around being awesome. And part of that awesomeness can be attributed to Vadim Limited out of San Jose, California, an ODM company that Sharp brought on to co-design aspects of the PC-7000 back in the day. The same Vadim that had previously designed the Moro Pivot, which somewhat evolved into the Zenith Z170, a direct competitor to the 7000. I don't have any big point to make here, I just find it amusing. 
And I think they did a nice job, with a more appealing look than the Pivot, and a better design than its predecessor, the 1984 Sharp PC-5000. That was their first computer targeted for sale in the US, and while its clamshell design was sweet, that skinny little 8-line LCD was a real hindrance. So the 7000's larger 10.5-inch STN monochrome LCD was a solid improvement, while still leaving much to be desired. On the positive side, it was illuminated with electroluminescent or EL backlighting, making it glow bluish green. Kind of like a souped up version of Timex Indiglo, if you ever had one of those watches. It also adjusted to 5, 10, and 15 degree angles, allowing for better viewing depending on where your head's at. And the 2.1 to 1 aspect ratio could display up to 640 by 200 graphics or 80 by 25 characters in text mode, ideal for DOS, word processing, and spreadsheets. But while having backlighting is nice, low contrast is not, and boy is this some low contrast. Adjusting the wheel above the tilt control lets you waft between contrast that's always somehow too high and too low at the same time, and it gets worse depending on ambient room lighting. Now, this was improved on the PC7100, but here it's just kind of blah. Inverting the display helps at times, but truthfully it's just an alternative style of bad. Now, well, at least the rest of the hardware was pretty darn decent for 1985, starting with the processor, an Intel 8086-2 running at 4.77 or 7.37 megahertz, along with 384 kilobytes of RAM, though it's limited to less than that to the user, as well as graphics that can switch between MDA and CGA, both in monochrome through the built-in display, of course and dual 5 and a quarter inch 360k floppy drives, slim ones at that, being packed into a rather small space narrower than a single full height drive. Around back is the PSU taking standard IEC power cords, a spot for the $255 CRT adapter upgrade with RGB output, 25 pin parallel and serial ports, and another spot for the $349 1200 BPS modem upgrade. There was also the $399 CE700P thermal printer, which would neatly snap in place on the back of the system for transportation and storage. Though it did have to be disconnected to be used, unlike some other systems with bolt-on printers that printed while attached. On the left-hand side is a lovely power switch, up top is the carrying handle, and on bottom is an interface for Sharp's CE710E expansion unit, which added a hard drive and three ISA expansion slots, creating a real tower of power situation. So yeah, no hard drive was included normally, but it did come with MS-DOS version 2.11 on floppy disk, something this didn't have, so I grabbed a copy online. It's a slightly customized version of DOS, with some small additions, namely the Sharp Diagnostic Program that performs a variety of tests on the PC-7000 and makes sure everything's in fine working order. Even cooler is the built-in setup program, accessible via this dedicated keyboard key. Anytime you need to change system settings, you can press that button and enter the menu, which lets you do things like change display settings, serial and parallel options, CPU speed, time, date, and so on. Now, this kind of thing in ROM was not a guarantee back in 85, so it's a welcome inclusion. And of course, along the front of the machine is where the keyboard clips in place, attaching to the system and protecting the LCD when stored and easily detaching when you need it. The coiled keyboard cable packs into this little slot, with RJ11 jacks on either end. It's more custom than that though, with the pinout and wiring differing from a standard phone cable. The board itself is pretty decent, with 84 full travel keys and a layout similar to the PCAT just with function keys along top, an overlay row above those, and backslash to the left of backspace, allowing for a larger enter. And the LED indicators for caps, scroll, and num lock are neatly built into the key switches themselves for each respective key. On that note, they're all linear ALPS key switches, with both SKFL and integrated dome round slider style switches, same as you found on a number of Japanese MSX systems back then. They don't feel great, and no doubt need a deeper cleaning, but even at their best, I'm not a huge fan of this type of lighter weight linear switch.
Getting inside the PC-7000 is simple enough, just remove a few screws and the whole back panel comes off, revealing a crowded yet tidy motherboard. Here you can see that 8086-2 CPU and its coprocessor companion socket ready for an 8087, as well as the onboard RAM, which could actually be doubled to a total of 768K. There's also the real-time clock battery, which I really need to replace, but hey, still works for now. And as mentioned earlier, this model had no hard disk, but later variants replaced one of the floppy drives with a 10 or 20 megabyte drive, giving the system some real desktop replacement potential. And really, that describes the PC-7000 overall. Potential! In its base configuration, it might not have had everything you'd ever need if you were a power user, but dang it if it didn't cover a whole lot of bases for a lot of folks. It's a properly capable MS-DOS PC, and it runs not much, if we're being honest, especially with only 320k of RAM and no hard drive, but whatever, that's half the charm these days, so I say enjoy it for what it does rather than lament what it doesn't. Like, hey, Flight Simulator 2 works great. Always a good test of IBM PC compatibility, and being able to fly around a deeply disappointing Chicago skyline on this thing is a treat. And so long as you fall within RAM and CPU restrictions, a number of late 80s titles work as well, from Sierra AGI Adventures to Wheel of Fortune. It's a good time, no alcohol required. And of course, there are no shortage of early 80s CGA and MDA classics to boot up and enjoy, from Tetris to Digger, Burger Time to Bouncing Babies. Now, sadly, some of my CGA favorites, like Round 42 and Paku Paku, do not work. They half start up, but due to the modified low-res trickery being utilized, it's graphically messed up enough to be unplayable. But that's an exception, thankfully, and games like Pharaoh's Tomb and other CGA shareware classics work just fine. And this is not far off from how I played it back in the day at my aunt and uncle's place, so it's oddly nostalgic stuff. Mmm, this kind of EL backlit LCD panel with its smeary low contrast imagery never fails to take me back! I may have grown up in the 90s, but obsolete hand-me-down machines like this were never too far away. It seemed like there was always some cousin, some friend of the family, some weird dude who showed up to live in your basement that had an obsolete PC kicking around and was like, Hey kid, wanna try some DOS? <laughs> it can't have only been me, right? I don't know, my childhood got weird, filled with strange individuals loaning out even stranger computers, slowly molding me into the LGR I am today. And that is the Sharp PC-7000, a decidedly middle-of-the-road machine in the middle of the 80s, but one that was easily and continually recommended as a result. The thing sold well in the hundreds of thousands, with new models featuring various integrated upgrades being sold until 1990. Not a bad run at all for a portable PC clone. It would have benefited greatly from an improved LCD, and from what I've read, even the 7100's improved display wasn't all that. But really, just add a hard drive and that CRT adapter to plug it into a real monitor, and you'd have a system that would serve as a nice PC at home, on a desk, and out on the road. On another desk. <laughs> like a hotel room or airport lounge or whatever. I don't know. It's no laptop. That much is clear. But it is a lovely, portable, luggable lunchbox machine for its time, and should you ever run across one for a nice price, I'd say snatch it up. It provides a proper mid-80s portable PC experience with all that entails. And if you enjoyed this computery retrospective, then do stick around. Making stuff like this on LGR is just what I do, and more is always in the works for your future viewing pleasure. And as usual, thank you for watching.